So the next revolution that we need to take a look at here um, is the French Revolution. And the French Revolution uh, begins in 1789, but the buildup to it occurs not only over years and decades, but over centuries. Um, for a long time in France, there was a widespread discontent among the middle and the lower classes because the way that French society was structured, the upper classes, the nobility and the clergy, people who worked for the Catholic Church, enjoyed privileges far beyond what the middle and the lower class did. And that wasn't uncommon in European society, but it was way more pronounced in French society. Um, the upper classes, the clergy and the nobility, uh, were subject to almost no taxes. They had social privileges that the middle and the lower class did not. They had a separate legal system uh, just for them, as opposed to the legal system that the middle and the lower classes were subject to. Um, so this discontent has been building up in France for decades, if not centuries. And then you have the American Revolution and the success of the American Revolution, mainly supported by France. And what happens is, is in, you know, 1787, 1788, a lot of the, you know, tens of thousands of French soldiers and sailors who had been in the Americas in support of the American Revolution returned to France full of this revolutionary, you know, enthusiasm. Um, not to mention that the Enlightenment is for the most part, based in France. Um, most of the major Enlightenment writers are French authors. So these Enlightenment ideals and this revolutionary enthusiasm is already there in France, and the success of the American Revolution starts to ramp it up and, you know, several notches. Um, in the meantime, the French government is nearly bankrupt. Um, they are essentially living, I guess the modern day equivalent would be paycheck to paycheck. Um, they are living tax collection to tax collection, mainly because the crown has spent so lavishly on not only its own lifestyle, but on wars against the English, wars against uh, the Italian city-states. They've spent lavishly to support the American Revolution. And this is nearly bankrupted France, and, you know, by the time the 1780s roll around. Um, now, all of this comes to a head in 1788. In 1788 and again in 1789, there are unusually long winters in France. And that unusually long winter in France runs over into the spring planting season. And that causes the wheat harvest in France to be one of the lowest in its history, back to back in 1788 and in 1789. So with a much lower than average wheat harvest, the price of bread, which in the late 1700s and even now today in French society is basically the cornerstone of a French diet, the price of bread almost quadruples in France in 1788 and 1789, which means that many middle and lower class people are starving, okay? Especially in 1789, um, you know, after two years of, in, you know, incredibly high bread prices, I mean, you literally have people starving and people are suffering. And unfortunately for the French government, you have a king in Louis the 16th who is wildly out of touch with not only his people, but the situation within his own kingdom, right? And not to mention that, but Louis is just not liked in general by the French people and neither is his wife, Marie Antoinette. Um, Louis is the grandson of the Sun King, Louis the 14th who is, you know, generally regarded as the greatest French king. Um, he builds, um, you know, the French empire and the French kingdom into what it is. Um, he's kind of the poster boy for absolute power. And Louis the 16th, the grandson, is 
nowhere near as capable as his grandfather. Um, he is very mild mannered. Um, he is shy publicly, so he does not leave his palace at, at Versailles very often. Um, so the people have, you know, no knowledge of him. He doesn't know them or their situation either. Um, his wife, Marie Antoinette, is an Austrian princess um, who is generally very disliked by the people. Um, they blame her for uh, Louis's problems when it comes to conceiving a son, a male heir to the throne, which is, you know, a big deal in uh, in and among the French nobility. Um, so Louis in general, as well as his wife, are not liked by the French people as is. And then in 1789, after two years of tax crises and rising bread prices, everything hits the fan. Um, so Louis is forced to call a special session of the French Congress known as the Estates General, right? And this Congress has not been called in 300 or so years. It was dissolved under Louis's great grandfather and never called again, basically meaning that the French people have had no voice in their own government for three centuries. So Louis calls together this Congress, this Estates General. And the way the Estates General is set up is in France, the people are divided into three social classes, the first, the second, and the third estate. The first estate is the nobility. The second estate is the clergy. These are the privileged social classes. And then everyone else in the country, like 98% of the population, all is lumped together in the third estate. And for the purposes of monarchy, this is actually a pretty smart thing to do because it's easy to control the first and the second estate because they're so small. And then by lumping everyone else into the third estate, um, you have many different voices, many different ideas, many different, you know, um, interests, all basically picking and fighting at one another. So it's a very simple way to keep the people divided and to keep the authority in the hands of the king, right? But Louis is in a desperate situation. He needs money. He needs to raise taxes, calls together the Estates General to basically get permission to raise taxes once again. Now, at this meeting of the Estates General, the members of the third estate deny not only Louis's right to raise taxes, but they also demand of Louis that he gives them the that he gives them the authority to write law and raise taxes in France because they are the overwhelming portion of the population. And obviously, not only for Louis, but for the first estate, the nobility, and the second estate, the clergy, this is an absolute nightmare. Um, they do not want the middle and the lower classes taking control of the government because that will be the end of their privilege and their tax breaks and everything else that they enjoy. So between Louis and the first and the second estate, they constantly and repeatedly block the third estate from gaining any kind of power. So eventually Louis um, shuts down the third, he shuts down the third estate and he basically dissolves the Estates General. Says, listen, this isn't working. I don't need your permission. I'm the King of France. I'm the King of France. He dissolves it, sends everybody home, locks everyone out of the meeting hall. Well, the members of the third estate who had been meeting at this Estates General then decide that they're going to take everything into their own hands. And they meet on a nearby tennis court because Louis had basically locked them out of the meeting hall. And they swear what's known as the tennis court oath. Um, and basically, this is a promise that they, re that they will not leave Paris until a constitution has been written for France. So they set about writing a constitution for France. They present it to Louis multiple times. And... Louis rejects it each time. And finally, after the third or fourth rejection, um, the situation becomes violent and revolution now breaks out.
So this is essentially the situation in France leading up to the revolution, right? You can see on the left there, this triangle kind of breaks down um, the social and the tax situation. Um, you have the clergy, which is known as the second estate, right? Which is roughly about 130,000 people in France. Um, they have their own legal system. They're exempt from the majority of taxes. And you have the first estate, the nobility, which is somewhere between 100 to 300,000 people. They also have special legal treatment. They're exempt from the majority of taxes. And then you have everyone else, 27 other people, all lumped into the third estate with no rights, no privileges, anything like that. And then you have a cartoon from a French newspaper on the right, which kind of explains the way the third estate feels about this situation, right? Where the first, essentially, the first and the second estate are crushing the people of France. They're crushing the third estate with the weight of their privileges and of their taxes. So, the French Revolution, right? Once it begins in 1789, this wheel spins relatively out of control. Um, but there's one thing about the French Revolution that you need to keep in mind. Even though it was directly inspired by the American Revolution, it is not the American Revolution. The two, other than the Enlightenment inspiration, couldn't be more different. Um, first and foremost, the French Revolution is directed at itself. It's directed at France. It's not overthrowing some foreign power. The French are literally rebelling and revolting against their own system and their own way of life, which means that different social classes within France, the working poor, the middle class, the artisan professionals, the nobility, the clergy, the royal family, are all going to be at war with one another. And because of that, the French Revolution is far more violent than the American Revolution. It's far more unstable. And the longer it goes, it becomes more and more radical, meaning that people want more and more dramatic changes to French society. Essentially, the French Revolution, unlike the American Revolution, is an attempt to completely tear down French society and start over from zero, basically rebuilding the French way of life from scratch, which the American Revolution was never about. Um, the, the people who fought in the American Revolution had no intention of changing their way of life. They just wanted out from under British authority. So the French Revolution is going to be far more dramatic, far more radical, and eventually it's going to spin far more out of control, right? So, hold please. Need a little sip of water there. Um, as the French Revolution moves on, uh, it goes through increasingly radical stages where more and more of French society and the French government is torn down um, and replaced. Um, in the early parts of the French Revolution, um, you have what's known as the National Assembly. They, these are the members of the Estates General who walk out and swear the tennis court oath. Um, their initial plan, which Louis rejected, um, was actually not that revolutionary. It was in line with what the British had at the time. Um, essentially, what they wanted was a constitution which guaranteed um, equal rights for all citizenship. They wanted tax equality, meaning not so much that they wanted to pay less, but they wanted the first and second estate to pay the same as they were paying. And they wanted a limited monarchy. They wanted limits on Louis's power so that he could not just simply make decisions without the approval of some sort of elected body. Um, and to Louis's credit, you know, he tries to hang on to his power, but in reality, if he simply would have accepted these limits, he probably would have lived until he was old and gray. Um, the fact that he was not willing to accept them, that he rejected any kind of limit on his power or any kind of restructuring of French society is part of, <laughs> is part of what sends this revolution spiraling out of control. 
right? So once Louis rejects the National Assembly and their ideas, um, the people of France begin violently revolting against um, the monarchy. Um, they storm the Bastille and free political prisoners, seize weapons and guns. There's fighting between the people of Paris and the Royal Guard. Um, a mob of 7,000 women march from Paris out to the uh, palace at Versailles, which is about 20 miles. And they storm the palace, basically kidnap the royal family and drag them back to Paris so that they cannot ignore the people. And eventually what happens is um, these people form what becomes known as the National Convention. And the National Convention is um, essentially a, a Congress within France that represents um, only the third estate. The nobility and the clergy are basically left out of this. So uh, you can see already that the ideas of equal treatment before the law and liberty and equality for everyone are, again, starting to be ignored in favor of just maintaining the momentum of this revolution. So under the convention, the royal family is eventually executed, which is what really sends the revolution into overdrive. Um, they also declare France a republic because you know, obviously the king is dead. They're no longer a monarchy. Um, beyond that, they also um, forcibly seize all of the land and the wealth of the first and the second estate. So they're literally confiscating money and land from the Roman Catholic Church. And in a country of 30 million Catholics, that is a really big step that not everyone is going to be okay with. Um, but they do it anyway. They um, seize it and they redistribute it um, along the government lines. Um, they also institute a national military draft um, to form a new French army because France's neighbors, specifically Austria and Prussia, are not okay with what's going on in France. And they're worried that this is going to spread to their kingdoms as well. So France and Austria, or sorry, Prussia and Austria both um, threaten and eventually invade France um, to try to put an end to the revolution. And so the National Convention is forced to begin what they call the, the Leve en Mas, basically a, a nationwide draft to defend the revolution. Now, under the National Convention, this is where things really spiral out of control, 1793 and 1794. Um, once the Austrians and the Prussians invade France to try to put an end to this revolution, the National Convention declares a state of emergency, and they appoint what's known as the Committee of Public Safety. And this is a committee of about 10 of the leading gentlemen of the convention, and it's led by Maximilien Robespierre, who was one of the early leaders of the revolution. And... Robespierre is basically given dictatorial powers in order to protect and save the revolution from these foreign invasions. And what ends up happening is that um, Robespierre, in his paranoia and in his revolutionary enthusiasm, goes on a basically two-year witch hunt. And tens of thousands of foreigners, tens of thousands of French citizens are arrested on basically just suspicion of disloyalty. Um, they are run through revolutionary courts where they are not allowed to have a lawyer. There is no burden of proof or proving that they actually said or did what they were accused of. Um, and tens of thousands of people are executed by guillotine. Um, under this Committee of Public Safety. And this is what becomes known as the Reign of Terror. And this is where the French Revolution really hits its low point, because now they have cast aside all of the ideals that they claim to represent um, by setting up these revolutionary courts, by giving Robespierre dictatorial powers, 
they have essentially replaced Louis with a new, more paranoid, more violent version of Louis in Robespierre. Um, and all of this is done in the name of saving the revolution. And so this is where you see that influence of the American Revolution, this idea that, oh, enlightenment inspired revolution is the natural order of things and it has to be protected at any cost from anyone even its own people in itself um now under robespierre some other very violent and radical changes are made uh the catholic church is outlawed which again just simply turns people against the revolution even more because i mean this is france it's 30 there's you know i mean 30 million people in france and probably 29 million of them are catholic and are loyal catholics so the outlawing of the church um it be, makes the revolution and robespierre very unpopular in the rest of the country um they do away with um the old french social classes um everyone is supposedly treated equal although women uh still face all kinds of discrimination um under this new government um there's a new calendar created universal male suffrage is given right giving all men the right to vote um and essentially this becomes like the complete opposite of uh of what existed under louis um and again it gets more and more radical as it goes on. Um, now, side note to remember, and this will be um, this will be helpful if you go and watch that AP Euro bit by bit video. Um, during this time, during the National Convention time of the French Revolution, this is where a lot of the ideas of um, modern political thought come from. The ideal of the idea of conservatism and liberalism comes out of this time period of the French Revolution. The idea of conservatives being the right and liberals being the left actually comes from the National Convention during the French Revolution because that's where the more conservative and the more liberal sides of the National Convention would sit. Um, so even though the French Revolution does spin wildly out of control, a lot of modern political thinking and a lot of modern political vocabulary comes from this time period, right? Now, thank for the, thankfully for the French Revolution and for the French people, the reign of terror does not last forever. Um, in 1794, Robespierre himself is accused by his fellow committee members of um, disloyalty to the revolution. He is arrested, run through a revolutionary court, convicted, and guillotined in the center of Paris. And with Robespierre's death, the reign of terror starts to wind down, um, and cooler heads start to prevail. And in 1795, um, a new government, is established known as the directory okay um and this is made up of five directors right these are high making high ranking members of the of the national assembly um and they are kind of formed like an executive board like you would see in a modern day corporation and they're the ones who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the country while the National Assembly is reformed and they serve as essentially a Congress that writes laws for um, the country. Now, this seems like a much more sensible form of government. Unfortunately, um, the way that the directory is set up, the Committee of Five Directors become wildly corrupt. Um, they begin their own mini reign of terror, similar to Robespierre. Thousands of people are arrested and executed. Um, freedom of the press and freedom of, the sp and freedom of speech are suppressed. Um, and eventually, um, this again begins to spiral out of control until 1799, the directory is overthrown by 
um, the top French general known as Napoleon Bonaparte. And under Napoleon, he creates um, a triumvirate between himself and major leaders out of the National Assembly, and they essentially form like a three-person military dictatorship. And this is kind of seen as the end of the revolution in 1799. And then in 1804, Napoleon basically pushes aside the other two members of the triumvirate, and he declares himself emperor of France. Um, so politically, if you look at the French Revolution, they start with an absolute monarchy under Louis and end with an emperor under Napoleon. So this is not a very successful revolution in terms of its political aspirations. Now, it is very successful in terms of its social aspirations because French society is completely restructured by this. Um, and under Napoleon, from 1804 to 1815, as Napoleon goes to war against um, the other countries in Europe, not only to build himself an empire, but also because, again, these countries are still terrified that these revolutionary ideas are going to spread to their country. Um, Napoleon is able to spread these revolutionary enlightenment ideas all throughout Europe, right? If you look at this map, you can see that Napoleon is able within only about 10 years or so, not even 10 years, five or six years, uh, he's able to defeat the Spanish. He's able to conquer the majority of Italy. Uh, he defeats the Austrians. He defeats the Prussians. Uh, he forces the Russians into an alliance with him. Um, essentially, the only country standing in his way are the British um, from basically dominating Europe. And one of the important things about Napoleon is as he brings all of these um, countries under his control, he continues to enforce the less radical parts of the French Revolution within his empire. Things like equality before the law, things like freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Well, sometimes freedom of the press. The press was free as long as it wasn't critical of Napoleon. If it was critical of Napoleon, then it was shut down and its offices were burned. But some of the less radical ideas of the French Revolution are put in place in places like Spain, Italy, Austria, Prussia, um, under Napoleon's reign. And this is important because this is going to um, give the people in these areas a taste of freedom that they have never experienced before. And even after Napoleon is defeated and run out of France in 1815, the people in Austria, the people in Italy, the people in Spain and in Prussia, um, and in even Russia itself, um, begin to demand a return to those rights and privileges that they had under Napoleon. And this is going to spark 50 years of revolution all around Europe as well.